recording. So this class is one that is offered by the OSU Land Steward Program. It's part of, part of our community education series, um, which is just a kind of series of one-off uh, classes that are offered. We have a volunteer committee and we ask our community what people want to learn about. We have ideas ourselves, or if we find really great um, educators while we're out there in the world, then you know we'll reach out to them. If you have any class ideas or topics you would like to learn about in that kind of one-off format, reach out to me. I'm Rachel Whirling. I'm the coordinator for the uh, Land Steward Program. We also have with us tonight Marcy Kaminker, who is the chair of our planning committee, and she's our co-host. And if we have any technological problems, uh, she, she might take the reins. Hopefully that won't happen. Um, if you want to hear about upcoming classes, you can visit our website. And again, I'll put this into the chat in a moment. When you go to that website, if you scroll down and click that join link, you can sign up for our class announcement email list. And that list, that email um, list only announces upcoming programs. So classes like this and the other things we offer, that's all you'll get on that um, email list. So for example, things that are coming up tonight, we have recycling today. Um, planning your year on the forest is offered by our partner forestry and natural resources program. In July, we have Green Your Garden with Gray Water, an introduction to household gray water systems. And that is going to be a strictly in-person class. There won't be any Zoom option on that and there won't be any recordings. That'll be the first in-person class of this nature we've had since the pandemic. Um, and then starting in September, I wanted to put a plug for our land steward training program, and that's our wonderful flagship program from which everything else springs. It's an 11-week uh, training that covers, uh, is a really wonderful introduction to land management practices for kind of living on rural land. So we talk about forests and wildfire, wildlife habitat, streams pasture management, uh, rural economics, rural water systems. And you work through, we do eight different field trips during that, uh, during that uh, class series. You will be creating a land steward management plan for your property, kind of figuring out what you have, how things are looking, kind of clarifying for yourself what you want and finding a way to get there. If you're interested, again, you can go to our website and, and look into more details or, or reach out to me. Let's see. So with that, I want to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, so tonight we're hearing about recycling today. This is focused in a local area. So we're going to be hearing from Jamie Rosenthal in her is in her seventh year as a waste zero specialist for recology in Ashland. That's a great idea. Waste zero. She is a Jackson County Master Recycler, serves on the, the City of Ashland's Conservation and Climate Outreach Commission, and is a member of the Association of Oregon Recyclers and the Oregon Refuse and Recycling Association. So I look forward to what Jamie has to offer us tonight. I'm gonna to stop my share and Jamie can share her screen and I'll kind of slip into the background here. All right, looks good. Thank you. Success. Okay. Can you, you hear me okay? Yep, can hear you. And I'm gonna put the spotlight on you for our, our recording. Oh, okay. I wanted to let you guys all know that you look great tonight and I'm envious of everything you're eating. And uh, <laughs> it's a tough crowd. Because I hear I that I'm laughing. Can't hear you. <laughs> um, but yeah, you all look great. So thank you for that. Um, you know, Mar or Rachel read uh, a little bit about my career, and um, I would just add that I am a wannabe land steward. In that I don't know what I don't know. Like just the other day, I learned that you know you don't want to pick trilliums because they, um, they'll die, like they won't come back. And I didn't know that, but I love being out in nature. I spent last weekend up in the Cascades Siskiyou National Monument and had my first great gray owl experience, which was super exciting. I'm more of a great horned owl person, but- um, Congratulations. I <laughs> yeah, it couldn't, I could not believe it. It was barking like a dog and I, yeah, it didn't make any sense. 
and then it flew over me. So um, I, speaking of dogs, I got myself a pandemic dog, uh, just like all of you, obviously. And I have a 16 year old son who just yesterday got his driver's license, slightly terrifying. Um, and I've been here in Ashland for, believe it or not, 25 years. Landed here for college and have been here ever since. Um, and yeah, I was fortunate not to lose my house in the Alameda fire. Um, so today the topic uh, I am speaking about is recycling today. And um, I think probably every single one of us has something about recycling. We're either in love with it or we're confused by it or we have a question about it or um, yeah. So I'm excited to talk and give you as much information as I can and look forward to all your questions. I, again, I'm in the Ashland area. Oh yeah, sorry, I probably should have put it on this one. <laughs> Uh, this is me. Uh, I fortunately uh, don't have to date someone who doesn't recycle right now, so that's great. And um, my official title is Waste Zero Specialist at Recology here in Ashland. Recology serves Ashland and the city of Talent. And so we, if you're from the Rogue Valley, uh, Phoenix, Central Point, Medford, White City, uh, you're probably, some of what I'm going to talk about isn't going to apply to you, but I'll make sure and um, help you out in that, in that way. Um, let's see here. All right, I need to change this view here. Eh, it's okay. Um, one of my, just a little bit more about me, I manage the recycling center on Water Street here in downtown Ashland. Uh, over to the lower uh, right side is Jose. He is there five days a week. And if you ever need a reason to smile, he is, he's always smiling. So uh, at our recycle center in Ashland, we have um, a few really unique programs. Uh, for a long time, we recently um, had to discontinue it. Uh, we have adopted over 200 dogs out of this recycle center, which is a very unique form of recycling. Uh, right now, because we aren't able to have dogs on site, uh, we all the cans and bottles that we collect we donate them to Friends of the Animal Shelter. And so they are able to support their organization that way. We have a couple neat programs here. One that's fairly new is called the Lend Me a Plate program. That program is all about providing flatware, uh, tablecloths, napkins, dishware, silverware, even wine glasses. If you're going to have a big event, you can rent those items, no charge. Uh, there are some expectations and an agreement that it comes back clean. And um, so that's a really neat program that is all volunteer run. We just simply provide the space. Uh, we also have, um, right now it's uh, not happening, but we have a free box, which is a clothing exchange that also no money exchange. You can bring clothes to donate or you can come and go shopping, whatever, whatever floats your boat. And we also recycle inkjet cartridges there. We recycle mixed recycling, cardboard, even metal lids, we have a separate collection for metal lids. I'll probably get to that later, why metal lids can't go into your recycling cart. And um, what else am I forgetting? Oh, we have composting demonstrations down there. So um, if you're ever in Ashland, come by and check it out. It's a really unique place. And there was actually a point where 
they were thinking about closing it down because we have curbside recycling here in Ashland. So why do we need a recycling center? Was the thought at least. And uh, they put out a vote. And oh, actually before that, before the city council voted, they put down those little strips that cars run over and they were shocked to find out how many people visit the center every day. So it's a very popular place to go. And uh, yeah, you can make a new friend there. Uh, another part of my job, I create, <laughs> try to be pretty clever um, with my educational advertising, if you will. I hold workshops for the community. This was uh, over on the left here. That was a pandemic workshop because it couldn't meet in person. And then over on the right, take a look at Recycling 101 here. It says, circle what can't be recycled in curbside carts. So if you're paying attention, and it says right there at the bottom, all of those items actually can't go into your blue roll cart. So, and we'll get into some of the reasons for that later. My most stressful, I'm joking. Uh, one of my, this is where I make the, you know, this is where they justify my paycheck. I am also the only person willing to wear the buddy blue costume, which I don't know what happened, why no one else wants to. I. I was my mascot in high school one time, so I had that going for me. And then in college, I was the college mascot, but now I'm, I'm Buddy Blue. So I'll go, um, if you ever come to the Ashland 4th of July parade, that might be me in the costume, but don't talk to me because Buddy Blue, the mascot, doesn't talk. I did a lot of research on mascots and I take that role very seriously, <laughs> but, um, He's a lot of fun. Kids love him. Uh, down here in the lower right was at Bellevue Elementary School. Uh, it was their first assembly um, since COVID. So it was outdoors, parents came, we did, it was a Earth Day assembly and did a little skit with the kids. Those are the Bellevue bees that you're seeing there. And then we had a truck there for a demonstration and Buddy Blue was being Buddy Blue. So, uh, so, gosh, I need to move, hold, give me one second here. I'm going to move. All right, that's better. All right, the history of recycling. Now I'm a little better. I could be even better though. There we go. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of recycling, kind of where we are and also where we're going with it. And I realize right now we're not being super interactive, so um, I'll we'll, we'll work with that. So true or false, people became so disgusted with how wasteful society had become that they invented recycling. You can enter answers in the chat. Oh, okay. You can peek there. I don't know if you can see that. We've got one false. I, I'm going to say false. We're probably skewing the results by letting people know what people are saying. <laughs> it might be false. <laughs> might <Okay>. be false. <laughs> false. Okay, you've got a three, three votes so far. Okay, thanks for that, Rachel. I feel like we're all here together. Um, so, and just so you know, uh, you may have noticed this is an actual recollage. <laughs> It's this is an ecology photo um, because this this actually goes that far back in the history of ecology. So I think that's pretty cool. We've got the horses and the piling trash up on top of the carriage and whatnot. So you're not gonna let me. All right, false. Sorry for such a big false. <laughs> all those people that thought it was true. So uh, what we know at least about uh, in on the West Coast is that some of Recology's founders immigrated 
in the mid 1800s and they were persecuted against they they experienced a lot of racism people didn't want to give them jobs they treated them very poorly and what we know is that they decided to they had to survive and the way that they did that was to go around and examine other people's trash which they were just leaving along Side the road at the time, find things that they of value. So something that's metal that could be reused, they would find they would find something like that and they would sell it. And then that actually evolved into, I think they started to realize, oh my gosh, we've got problems with vermin and we're getting sick and we need to figure out how to manage our waste they became also the people that managed the waste as well. So it was this twofold uh, benefit and they started calling themselves the Sunset Scavengers. And just until I think within the last year or so, we had a Sunset Scavenger location in Recology. And there's still people working for the company that their, their lineage is, is you know, goes that far back. So it's pretty cool. So it's funny because I, you know, I'm in my 40s. I feel like I, I just curbside collection of recycling and trash. I feel like that's always been going on, but it actually hasn't. Um, in 1974, the first curbside bin, the tree saver, was used in Missouri. All right, so we've got another true or false. The tree saver was only for metal, paper, and milk jugs. This is 1974. <laughs> Rachel, do you want to do, do up to you? Do you want to answer in the the chat. Is this true or false? You may be muted, Rachel. I love this picture so much. So that's false. The tree hunger hu hugger was only taking paper at that time. And this man in this photo, I actually found this photo today. Um, he is like a world record, or at least a, contend a contender for world record tree hugging. So, I thought that was kind of cool. All right, so <clears throat> recycling has experienced um, what felt like a lot of ups. You know, we all felt good about it. We just did the thing and we felt like good human beings and that we were helping the planet. And then all of a sudden we found out that everything had to change and that uh, we weren't actually doing as much good as we thought we did. And that was pretty hard for people. I, I weathered the storm of, of this, uh, the receiving end of, the anger, the upsetness, uh, because people were really baked in the idea that they got to be a good person every time they put something in the bin. And what we learned 2017, 2018 was that recycling was basically being backhauled. So we get all these goods and services from China on these big ships that you see here on the left. And then rather than just sending all those cargo containers empty we shoved our recycling in them and went here you go china and what was happening well, as you can probably imagine we were filling these containers right with all this stuff right and then some places in china they'd have an organization or a business that was reputable sorting through these materials 
and then in more impoverished areas they may wait for a cargo container to show up and it's just you know they're living in poverty and they're just trying to get um, the most valuable types of plastic they can and then maybe selling it and then burning it to stay warm at night which breathing plastic so this this documentary plastic china came out it's very hard to watch but it if i highly recommend it if you're actually um you know because everyone says well china just stopped taking our recycling well what's beneath that is that their people were <laughs> very very sick a lot of them were and this was this this huge problem so we had to China, you know, closed its doors and we had to make some changes. And the the biggest issue, the, the hardest part about all of this is that the main issue is with plastic. So back when recycling began, it was that the materials collected had value and could be sold and used, potentially used again or made into something, you know, metal could be melted down. Uh, you know, we, we just had very little plastic. In fact, I think when it started, it was only milk jugs that we were recycling. So now in this day and age, we have over 40,000 different types of resins of plastic. So when you see a number that's between one and seven, it's not that there's <laughs> seven types of plastic it's that there are seven categories so if you've ever i I've, i receive these types of questions quite often why can't you just go by the numbers well there you go there's 40 different th types of plastic within that and then also another reason why we can't go by the numbers is that just because something is uh, let's let's just say we really like collecting number one plastic, but we have a number one on a lid, a plastic lid. Plastic lids shouldn't go into your recycling because they're going into the mixed recycling with uh, like cardboard boxes, um, and those plastic lids can get easily trapped in the fibers of cardboard, and then once that cardboard is sectioned off, it's got a piece of plastic in it. And that's a problem if you're a manufacturer trying to sell your boxes to, you know, whoever, they don't want to, their customers going, wait, I, I lost my product because there was a big piece, it fell through this hole that was there because there, I guess there was a piece of plastic there. So <clears throat> we can't just go by the, no that's, um, there, I'll get into that a little bit as well later about what what the issue with the numbers is. But um, the other thing I wanted to say since I'm talking about the numbers is, you know, you notice that the the number is in this chasing arrow triangle. And one of the things that's unfortunate in this day and age is that chasing arrow symbol is not trademarked. So anybody could use it for any reason. And there's a lot of issues with that because uh, the seller, uh, manufacturers of products, they want their customers to feel good about the purchase. And they know that everyone loves to feel good about the recycle symbol. That, that just means you're a good person if you're going to buy something that has that symbol on it. So they slap it on everything. So that's another challenge that we deal with on a regular basis. I just received a call the other day uh, from a gentleman who was very, very upset because his product, or I can't even, I can't remember what it was exactly, but it said, please recycle on it. And I had to explain to him that they just wanted him to feel good about purchasing the product. And he understood. Um, we live in a funny world right now. So just in case you are um, all in the fetal position eating your dinner because it's super not uplifting, I wanted to 
uh, talk to you about recycling like a hero. A lot of you are from the Rogue Valley area and within the Rogue Valley area, I'll tell you, not all recycling is the same. What we offer in Ashland and Ta Talent is, is quite a bit different than what's offered in um, outside of Ashland and Talent. And then I think we have some people who are um, in, I think I heard British Columbia and maybe someone in Washington. So just know that um, I am going to speak to some items that I believe are universally not recyclable. Uh, so stay tuned. But if you want to be a hero, I would say that the most important thing is to know what your hauler, so the, the company comes and picks up your recycling, know what they say they take because you can you know we have a lot of people that move up from California and they say well I could recycle all this in California well we don't have the same resources that California has we don't have the same outlets for the material that California has and therefore you know in order for something to be truly recyclable we have to have an outlet for it um, so that's something to just keep in mind. Don't ever assume that you know. So here in our area, this is kind of what our list looks like. Um, but if you go into Phoenix, you know, uh, we service talent, but if you go into Phoenix, their list is reduced to four or five items. Um, this is, a quite a bit more expansive than that and um, that is in large part because of the market. Recology is based in San Francisco and we have a, um, a larger market, market than, than the hauler in Medford. Um, something that I'm thinking of right now that we get a lot of questions about is you know where, where does where does it go? What, how do you know, how do you know it's not just getting like shoved up a sea turtle's nose or something like that? And um, so fortunately, uh, this company that I work for, we, we go out and we vet, we have a specific person who works in San Francisco, his name is Bo, and he goes out and he vets all the various places that we send our material to make sure that there isn't anything um, going on that is not good for the environment or they don't support their people well. And um, they also have certificates from the government <laughs> like that they've earned that say they are reputable. So uh, I feel really good about working for this, this company. Personally, I, um, I wouldn't be working for a company that I felt like was doing something uh, that they shouldn't be with the recycling. So, okay. So these items are items that, let me just make sure, curtains may be an exception. Yeah, I would say I would be willing to bet, oh, uh -oh go back. I, I, I'm not much of a gambler, but I would be willing to bet a dollar <laughs> that almost all of you don't live in areas that are able to recycle any of these items. And I would like to, at this point, Rachel, open up for questions because I think um, I can offer the reasons why. Um, I know a lot of people really want to recycle their egg cartons, for instance, or their um, other carton, their milk cartons. And I can speak to, um, you know. Yes, please do. Why can't we recycle our egg cartons? <laughs> so um, egg cartons are at a point that, 
uh, we call it end of life material. So they have gone through the process of recycling. They, um, the fibers have gone through the process of recycling so much that they don't hold together very well. It's really, it's really easy to, to kind of tear apart a uh, egg carton and you can see the fibers there. There isn't, it's just, that's, that's their end of life. Can we compost them? Yes. I, I compost mine. They break down like that. Um, oh, and compostables is something I want to talk about as well. Um, yeah, that's the issue with egg, egg cartons. I, when I, you know, go camping, if I need a fire starter, I can, I have that. And, you know, there's lots of other uses as well. So Kathy, Kathy says, can you say why each of the items on the slide cannot be recycled? Sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, the plastic bag on the upper left side, plastic bags, and those are ones, <laughs> check it out. Next time you get a plastic bag, it'll say, please recycle. What I think they mean, because they mean well, right? What I think they mean is um, that you should take that to back to a grocery store where they have a bunch of plastic bags. And then that grocery store is uh, part of, in theory, a program like Trex. Trex is a company that makes decking and benches out of plastic bags. And there are a lot of grocery stores that are part of that program here in our area. Now, what happens when you stick a plastic bag in your recycling cart, and this is universal, as far as I know, I would be shocked to, to hear that there's a facility that, that somehow can get plastic bags out of, anyway, that, that they can sort the plastic bags out of the mixed recycling. Uh, I've toured major, major sorting facilities, and what happens is those plastic bags they wrap around the gears that propel the mixed recycling onto its next destination. And the, it, if enough of them get going in there, they get hot and they turn into a gooey mess. And then they, the whole recycling facility, I mean, this huge facility has to be completely shut down because it's they've got to cut those bags out and, uh, so they, they just wreak havoc in the recycling process at sorting facilities. So if you have an organization or a grocery store at our recycle center, we take them as well. And we are part of that TREX program. I highly recommend just, just um, storing them. And what I would say is even better is just don't, don't use them. In Oregon, <laughs> We, oh gosh, we did, I can't remember the exact details of the, the law, but um, we in essence banned the type of plastic bag that you're seeing here. And there, a law was made that it was okay. Like if you get a plastic bag now at a grocery store, it's like five mil oh and you can get as many five mil right. of, of those and this is all because we banned those so it's just like one of those crazy things that drives me nuts it's like okay well they, yeah they found the loophole so um when you say that you're part of the treks you mean people have need this is what i do at any rate i save my plastic bags up and then i take them down to the recycling center and i put them there we can't have it in our mixed recycling right right yeah we can't have it in the mixed recycling because of what i described about the, yep. the gears and if you bring it down to the recycle center that will eventually make its way to treks and treks will turn it into decking and benches or whatever else they do with the material so yeah uh so with regard to okay what do we want to do next so it went over egg cartons um yeah milk milk or coffee cups? so yeah so cartons uh milk cartons juice cartons 
the issue with those there's a there's a couple potential issues um one i i can't tell you how many times i tell my teenager teenager to rinse out my the milk jugs we don't get cartons but we get milk jugs <laughs> that doesn't happen and that's a problem but um mainly with milk jugs there if you look at the the orange juice one there are multiple materials in one item so you've got that plastic uh cap right that's a different kind of plastic uh, the item itself is mostly made of paper, but then it's got this waxy coating on it. And let's say you clean it really great. Let's say you put it, you know, only a little soap. Let's say it's just pristine and you take off the cap and whatnot. That waxy coating, the thing that keeps it from spilling out in the grocery store, is also what keeps it from breaking down in the recycling process. So we need that fiber to be able to be released to turn it into new fibers. And with, with milk cartons, that's just not possible. Uh, shred paper. We get a lot of um, questions about uh, shred, uh, paper shred. And uh, the issue with that is if you put a bunch of, okay, have you ever emptied your own sh shredder and you feel like you need like your COVID mask just to protect yourself from breathing all of that? That is exactly what happens in recycling sorting facilities. Uh, it just creates just terrible air to breathe. And on top of that, these conveyor belts move fairly quickly and it just it just goes everywhere like confetti so at the end of the day they've got all this this dirty shred on the ground and it's mixed with other things that shouldn't be you know that fall off the line as well so um it's just one of those items that uh we don't have the technology yet i don't know if we ever if we, i don't know what we would even do i'm not i'm not in research and development so uh, maybe tubes where we put our stuff in tubes. I don't know. So that's the issue with shred. There is low, if you live in the rogue Valley, uh, there is a company named rogue shred. And if you have a, I don't, I know that they do pick up residential and business, but I don't, I, I don't know anything about the cost or anything like that. So that's an outlet for it. Uh, Let's see here. I did talk about plastic lids earlier. Again, the issue with plastic lids pretty universally is that those little lids can get caught in between pieces of cardboard. Uh, the They just, yeah, the nature of the item just makes it, we just don't have the technology for it yet. Now here in, if it's a metal lid, if you're able to Put it inside the the can that it you know is a, came with, uh, and you're able to make sure that it doesn't come out of the can because it's actually a lot easier than <laughs> it's surprisingly easy for it to come out. You have to really clamp it well. That's okay. You can do that. And then if uh, that isn't an option, we metal metal is something that here in my own house. I, I don't even mess with doing the can thing because I don't, it just feels like I might cut myself or something. And uh, metal is a highly recyclable material independently. So we have a collection out at our transfer station. And once I get a critical mass, I have a big, like a double mason jar size. I put my bottle, you know, bottle caps, lids, you could uh, even put like twist ties from your bread in there. And it's just this big jar of metal. And then I, when I get that critical mass, I take it out to the transfer station and we have a metal section. It's even free to do that. And the reason it's free is because they pay us for it. So if um, you live in this area and want an option for your metal, Oh, and we also accept those metal lids in a separate area at our recycle center. And then it goes from our recycle center 
out to Schnitzer Steel in White City. And I love it. <laughs> um, let's see here. Clamshells, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but just to the left of the pizza box, that's what we call a clamshell for somewhat obvious reasons. The reason clamshells, there's a couple issues with them. Uh, one, it's usually a very low grade value of plastic, so there aren't any manufacturers going clamoring for, I want that clamshell plastic so I can make my vitamin bottle out of it. It's just, there's not a market for it. Um, the other issue is, it. I don't know if you've ever, I've seen these in like, you know, parking lots at restaurants or whatever, they're just completely smashed. They smash very easily, and again, it's similar to the lids, is they can be trapped in between pieces of cardboard in that journey that they go on when they get to the, uh, the sorting facility. So, um, you know, I'm seeing over here in the upper right, hangers. Hangers, we get a lot of hangers, um, and the reason I think people put them in there is they think, oh, they're metal, and those are also very problematic in the same way that, oddly, but I think you could probably imagine it, they bend very easily and they wrap in the gears of um, the sorting equipment. And so the hangers would be something that you could also just keep separately and recycle that metal separately, but not put into your mixed recycling. So I think I covered it. Um, there's the solo cup. That's uh, basically that the issue with the solo cup is that it's a very low grade um, type of plastic that there's not a demand for. Um, and the coffee cup and the pizza might fall in the same category. Oh yeah, the pi I skipped that one. Um, so the pizza box, if that top of the pizza box doesn't have any grease on it, um, you can rip that off and put that in your recycle cart. It's not a big deal. Now, if it has any grease on it, um, it shouldn't be this way, but recycling sorting facilities have a horrible problem with rats. And it, if there's any kind of att attractant that way, um, it, it makes the rat problem worse and they're doing everything they can to keep that down. Uh, so that's, I, I couldn't believe my eyes when I went and I believe it was the sorting facility up in Portland that I saw. And it was kind of at the end of the day and it just, rats just descended all over the recycling. What if you have like a cardboard box? This happens to me sometimes. I have a cardboard box that I've maybe, like I've been pulling weeds in my garden and they're grass seeds and stuff. So I put them in the cardboard box, but there was, there was earth, dirt and stuff. And so mm -hmm. now the box, now I, you know, I do something with those weeds and now my box is now not a pristine cardboard box. Is that dirt also an issue? I don't think so. I, you know, I think there's, as long as it's not wet dirt or wet cardboard. Okay. You're okay. Okay. So it doesn't have to be like pristine. It just, it's no, you don't have to be got it. Okay. Yeah. And, and then someone said, is there any facility that can recycle plastic covered paper Plastic covered paper. Oh, this is a good question too. And then also the cardboard boxes, there's usually tape or sometimes staples. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the tape and the staples, the, when the, so if it's a cardboard box, it's in theory gonna be recycled with a, a lot of other cardboard. It'll go into this bath the plastic tape will float, the staples will sink. So. Oh, okay. That's great. Yeah. And so somebody said, is there any facility that can recycle plastic covered or plastic lined paper? Here in the Rogue Oh, the Valley. tape. So maybe that answered that. I guess maybe that got that because they had the same question about the tape. Sorry, it was a multi part yeah, so question. Yeah, it's, it's a lot harder <laughs> when it's a milk carton coated with plasticky, waxy okay. stuff. Uh, that there is carton recycling. I still, in seven years of doing what I'm doing, I don't understand. 
it, it, there's a lot that goes into it and I'm not sure that the net benefit is there. So I feel like we yep. should, I feel like everyone should be obligated to do a tour of these recycling centers so that we understand <laughs> it does help how it works. It, it really, really helps. It really helps a lot to see. Yeah. Cause once you know why you can't do the thing you can do, you know? Okay. And so Marcy says, if the cardboard goes into a bath after you recycle it, why is it a problem if it is wet when you deposit it at the recycling center? I think that has to do with mold growing. And also if every, there's a issue with weight. So when we transport things, I'm trying to think where does our, our cardboard would be either going to Portland or the heavier it is. So if it's wet, it's heavy, the more expensive it it is and so we want people to if 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 we we want to keep the cost down for it we want them to know that it needs to be dry so the um the hot chocolate cup or coffee cup it's the same the same issue with that as it is with the milk carton that waxy coating makes, there's no way of, of separating that easily. Um, so that's an item that would either need to be, yeah, some other use, maybe a plant or something. <laughs> so um, are we okay to move on from the slide or does anyone? I, I think we are, I, I'm not seeing more questions there. Okay. So this takes us to, uh, I wanted to mention the problem with compostables. Let me take a little sip here. Hold on. I alluded to this a little bit earlier. You know, we slap this, this label on it and we say, please recycle and you feel good about it. And here's my money. And um, <laughs> it's it's a it's a tough topic so i know that for a while i was buying compostable garbage bags and then i learned that any at least in this area any industrial composting facility and and that's if it's a mom and pop shop they really don't want it unless this I, the the plastic plastic because it is pol there are polymers in it unless it breaks down within 90 days it's it's gonna put a bunch of green plastic looking items in their compost and imagine if you're going to your grange and you're buying a bag of compost and you open it up and you see all these little pieces of of green stuff in there you're going to feel good about that compost. I, I wouldn't, I personally am still going through the compostable coffee filters that I bought because I compost in my own backyard. And I thought, well, I'm going to just experiment with these coffee filters. And you would think coffee filters, right? You just, they're like tissue paper. Years. <laughs> they're still there. And so there's no, when these, manufacturers say it's compostable i mean in a way you could argue that pretty much anything is compostable because in several lifetimes it won't be around so it there's this there's this really shady area of grayness where they don't really have to kind of like shampoo companies don't really have to substantiate the fact that they make your hair thicker or curlier or shinier or whatever it's a little bit like that. And I hope that that changes, but right now I would say that if you're using garbage bags, don't waste your money on compostables because they're not really doing that much good. They're just more expensive and um, someone's capitalizing off of uh, your kindness basically. So 
I am trying to think of other things. We, oh, the other issue with compostables is a compostable cup that you get at like, you know, uh, let's say you get an iced coffee and it's in a, in a compostable cup. And then there's the coffee that's not in a compostable cup, it's just regular plastic. It is very hard at this point, these, these very expensive facilities, state of the art, it is very hard for the, the equipment to tell the difference between a compostable cup and an actual plastic cup. Therefore, the compostable cups go in with the plastic cups and compromise that plastic and devalue it so no one wants to buy it. So that's another issue where it's, you know, it's like, I get that coffee places, they, I, I believe that people think they're doing the wrong, right, the right thing. And their customers like it as well. So it's validating, but it, there's, there's problems with it, so. I'm wondering if, um, like I know I have friends who live in Berkeley and I think they have curbside composting bins in Berkeley, I believe. And I'm wondering if it's like more of an industrial composting situation where it maybe heats up more and is the right humidity and rather than your backyard compost pile or something uh, where it's maybe hey. not ideal conditions. I can tell you that they, they find ways to deal with it, but they don't want it. And it makes everything, it compromises everything. Wow, that's terrible. I hadn't even seen a headline about that. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> I, maybe I could find one. I haven't, I've known, you know, this for a while, but yeah. Greenwashing, it's a real- So problem. Carolina says, um, which is the, what is the difference between biodegradable and compostable? It's kind of the same thing, right? That's, or, I mean. I think they, the manufacturers use them interchangeably. Yeah. I mean, biodegradable. These words, you know, we throw these green, biodegradable, eco, you know, and we say these words and it's like, I'll just go back to the shampoo example. Well, what does that really mean specifically? You know, what's underneath that? And, you know, I'm not, <laughs> there are other ways to care for the earth, land stewards, than buying biodegradable garbage bags. Don't buy a new car when you don't need one. Don't buy so much stuff, period. So that's something that is hard for people because we like to buy stuff. Uh, this is, I feel like there's so much more to say, but at this point, um, I just wanna say thanks for, let me check the time, seven, oh, okay, all right. You said at least 20 minutes left. I did not think I could talk this long. So if we wanna open it up to just random questions, uh, Sure. Um, if you want to, if you want to stop your share, I mean, if you're done. Oh, sure. Yeah. With screens, then the folks will pop up. And if folks want to um, have a chat about this, if you feel free to turn on your video, if you want, okay. or you can put more things in the chat. I, I had some questions. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I was wondering about was um, the deposit on beverage containers. And oh. if, this isn't necessarily your bailiwick. I don't know if it is, but uh it's so a, couple, a two prong question on that. One is what happens to the unclaimed deposit? I tend to just recycle. And if I put it on my curb and I, and somebody, a picker comes by and takes out the things with the deposits, then I, then it gets turned in for deposit. But if that doesn't happen, it doesn't. And I know that that's a lot of unclaimed deposit money. So that's one question. And then the other question was, I've heard people express frustration or anger that pickers, as they might be called, people who are coming and gleaning the deposit material out of the recycling containers um, for the deposit money, you know, be, being like mad that they're doing that because now it's, I don't know why. I can't imagine. It seems like that would be a higher use if someone gets a little of that deposit money back and then they get recycled. I don't know that, like, uh, I lived in Mexico for a long time and the deposits, you really, 
they really refilled those bottles. I'm not sure that, I don't think our bottles are made to be refilled now. I bet they just get recycled. So two, the two questions, unclaimed deposit, yeah. and then is there a high, what's the highest use or is there a higher use? Those, I'm really glad you asked that because that was something that I meant to create some slides on because Oregon, we're one of the first, I think we were behind Maine or maybe we were even the first uh, in creating the bottle bill. And the whole reason for the creation of it was that people were, I don't know, doing whatever they do, drive, <laughs> chucking their beer cans along the freeway or whatever, right? And so they incentivized it by saying, okay, when you buy, you guys know how it works, um, you're gonna have to pay the five cents at the time. And so, that was before the bottle bill was created before curbside recycling was readily available okay so and they also had to look at uh aluminum is highly recyclable like it's such a valuable recyclable so let's incentivize people to hold on to their cans and go get their money back that it's their money right okay so so I'm going to answer your second question first, whether you put it in your recycle cart and you decide to forego your 10 cents, re your, the redemption part of it, it's going to get recycled. And if you let someone have it, you know, it's going to get, it's all going to get recycled either way, as long as you're not shoving it in your garbage can. It's gonna but none of it gets refilled. Like in the old days, the deposit was actually, or or in, in Mexico, it's still yeah. this way, I think, where you're there are these heavy duty like beer bottles or soda bottles, and they're gonna they're gonna refill them. They're all bumped and bruised on the edges and they're gonna recap them and which is like reusing also. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a twofer. No, nothing like that is going on. Okay, right. Uh I I love the first question. Who gets the money if you don't redeem, if you just put them in your recycling? Who gets that money? The Oregon Beverage Recycle, Oregon OBRC, OBRC is act, OB, Oregon Beverage and Recycling Commission. So that was a commission created I don't, I'm not sure if it was right after the bottle bill was created, but that's the commission that oversees, they're like the middleman, right? So something that's fairly scandalous in my mind is that, you know, if you don't meet your, so the, the, the OBRC's whole goal is to have a certain rate on uh, return their whole their whole goal is to make sure that people are recycling or or yeah it recycling which is hard because now we have curbside recycling so just because you don't redeem it doesn't mean you don't recycle it but that's what their foundation is so what if you work for a company where you have a goal but if you don't meet your goal, your company makes a ton more money. I think I can just leave it at that. It just- Yeah, I, I used to do money. environmental education with kids. And when we were trying to pass the outdoor education bill, which did pass and some funds now go to that, when we were trying to figure out where, how could money find this so that kids can do outdoor school, um, that money was one of the thoughts was like, can we get that money? But yeah, interesting. No, you can't because <laughs> they have Do it. you have any idea what percentage like isn't claimed? I would imagine that it's most of it. Because curbside, yeah, because a lot of people don't want to go through the trouble. Right. Of, if they only drink a six pack a month or a, even a week, I mean, do you really want to go through the trouble? Uh, you know, so uh, I don't, I don't remember, but it's, it's, it's not pretty. I know it's not good. It's not like, I was trying to Google it here. If I find it, I'll, I'll share it with folks. Yeah. If I, yeah, um, it's not good. 
it's not yeah, good. that's irritating okay okay so uh marcy says our new grandson in the bay area has been using compostable diapers though a company through a company that provides the diapers and collects them reportedly so they can go to a company that makes it into potting soil. Do you think that is legitimate? Is it really compostable? If there's, I mean, it's all about really good infrastructure. I have heard of compostable diapers. I don't know that I could speak on it. Um, if if it's all, a, a, if they close the loop within themselves, it's, I mean, I, I highly doubt that they would be going through. I mean, who wants to collect that? Yeah, right. It would be a specialty thing if it was going to happen. Yeah. Marcy. Okay, so you got to verify yourself on that, Marcy. It sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's here's a nice simple one. Um, do you take aluminum pie plates in Ashland? Sorry. Yes, we do. We ask that because of their the nature again. This goes back to the flat issue that you just create a ball out of it and because oh yeah so it just doesn't it's not as easy for it to get trapped in between cardboard or how something. about aluminum foil or as we call it in minnesota tin foil mm -hmm. just make a okay ball. same thing but, but not a small ball. ball you want to just get a you know critical mass okay. maybe softball size and you're good to go yeah Okay. Um, Lewis says we lived in Germany from 2007 to 2010, and we were allowed one bag of garbage. And after that, we were charged for any additional bags. We then split our glass, paper, plastics, and all other trash and were forced to take them into big green dumpsters located at various locations around the city. You drove the items there and you put the brown glass in the brown glass dumpster, the green glass in the green glass dumpster. Uh, the clear glass and the clear glass dumpster. You get the idea. Is it possible to be done here? One bag of garbage was all that was allowed. I wonder if that one was that one bag free. Oh, maybe with your garbage fee or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. But I thought that with the recycling, it seems like the solution, like so many things, is just that we pay what it really takes. And then that makes it become more about makes it worth it. I mean, what makes it worth it is the cost. So. Yeah, yeah, if you want. Yeah, it's really true. Uh, so we we charge for, you know, the trucks to come to your house and collect the recycling, the green debris, the waste. And if we had, if we went back in time and did source separation and we had all those people on the road, maybe, maybe they care that much and drive their waste to the right spot, but maybe they don't. And then that's an environmental impact that way. Because people are then dumping their garbage on the road. Is that what you're saying? Or, or uh, putting, uh, they don't want to, they don't want to take their glass to the place where they're supposed to take it. And so it's going in their garbage or, you know. Well, I was thinking, and maybe this is getting a little too out there, but if we paid, not that I'm suggest, not that I want to pay more fees, but if I pay more for my garbage, will that cost um, make it work, you know, work for recology to recycle you know it was the transporter what's i know when the whole china clamp down came it was like there just wasn't a place to do it well but so, we didn't even have to change anything in regards to what we could our list stayed the same throughout the recycle crisis because we had good outlets for it um so are you saying so are you you're saying if we were to how do we fix it is the question <laughs> fix, fix but what what are we fixing are um we fixing is it? there is it just a question sort of like externalizing costs i mean we're saying it's not i i mean i would go on the record and say that here in ashland and talent we are paying to do the right thing with our material okay all right absolutely whereas other there there are different interests in different areas ashland and talent really care about recycling conserving waste 
uh, other areas in our valley, they don't want to pay for that. And that's okay. why that's why they don't they only have four things that they're recycling. Okay. Um, so I there's a question here. Do you take nursery four cell or six cell plant pots in Ashland at the center or four inch nursery pots, nursery plastic? The issue with those is that uh, number one, well, there's, a, I don't know how I can, I can't prioritize them, but one of the issues is that black plastic, nobody wants black, there aren't manufacturers that want black, black plastic unless they're creating black plastic. And there's not that much black plastic being created unless it's, hmm. so, and a lot of times it's, a cheap, it's cheaper for a manufacturer to buy virgin plastic than it is mm. buy okay. back the wow. black plastic. Okay. However, so I don't believe there's any areas uh, here in Ashland that will take plant pots, but Lowe's, I would highly re recommend calling them before just going over there and getting all upset about it if they don't take it. But as far as I know, Lowe's will. I understand that part of the reason that more smaller organizations don't take them back as they're worried about contamination. Like if there was some kind of, I don't know enough, uh, enough about botany to <laughs> speak on it, but. Oh, uh, plant. Uh huh. Diseases. Yeah. Some kind of. Yeah. Uh -huh, know, or fungi but, or something like that. Yeah. 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 Um, I had a question too. If you could talk about how clean things like glass need to be and this is something in my family or you know p prior to this kind of recycling crisis also that came up there'd be questions so let me give you a couple of scenarios one might be like a peanut butter jar how clean does it need to be cleaned here's another example an olive olive oil a glass olive oil jar and it's got the plastic insert or uh, vinegar but olive oil is a better example or salad dressing or something mm -hmm. you know do i need to pull the plastic top out and clean it really well with with soap and then okay so how clean yeah you don't want any, you don't want anything that's egregious uh but a little it's it's gonna get a bath so to speak it's probably gonna be broken into a million pieces first mixed with a bunch of other stuff other glass and then get a bath before it goes on in that process you do want to be considerate of like the rat issue so if it's super oh, okay. egregious you know just do the best you can but don't waste a bunch of water okay to, you know. Okay. How about those plastic, you know, nozzle insert things that are in bottles? Do they need to be pulled out? Plastic nozzle. Insert. I mean, like if I have a um, an olive oil jar, it has a little plastic insert in the mouth to make it pour easily, or vinegar bottle, or. Okay. No, I don't know. I wouldn't worry about it if you can yeah. easily get it. It helps if you can, but again, if all that glass is going to go into the bath, the the plastic is going to float to the top so oh it's going to be broken up yeah okay all right okay, yeah the, the area here in ashland and i can only speak for ashland and talent all our glass we do correct collect separately it goes up to portland to a company named glass to glass and they turn it into new glass so it they have this amazing technology where they they want it broken and then they have optical sorters that sort the green and the brown and the clear. It's crazy. Wow. Neat. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's see here. Any other questions that I've had? That was really helpful about the lids, knowing why the lids are a problem. That was useful. And then could you recap? I think I was looking for a link or something to put into the chat and I missed. We can recycle tin cans, right? Or like. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. You're saying that's a good one. That's easy to get. Do we oh, need yeah. to take the, the um, paper labels off? No. Because okay. that metal is going to get heated up to 1 million degrees exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that paper is just going to be toast. Okay. Oh. That's helpful too. Any other questions out there, you folks? Um, that was good because I had I had a few specific questions. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of what else I, I'm not remembering. 
So your pizza boxes can't go in because they have grease, but it's a different reason, but your bottles don't have to be totally class clean, but still think of the rats. And the bottles, keep in mind that the bottles are going separately in a, oh, into a different in a kind bin. of facility. So if they were mm. super, super dirty and they were going to get the, because, you know, with the mix, if they were going to compromise the mix, it might be different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, good. That was helpful. Okay, well, I'm going to quickly, thank you so much, Jamie. And while we finish up, I'm going to quickly launch this poll. And if folks can answer just four quick questions. And at the bottom, you know, as at the beginning, I mentioned that we're going to start, um, is it launched? Marcy, tell me if it's not launched. I think I, it's launched. Okay, um, we're starting to do things in person. So <laughs> I don't see and it. whether we actually our very last class that we did was a hybrid, which was a, the first time I had done that. So we have cameras in our auditorium so we can actually kind of do the in person class and the zoom class and it's a whole other oops. Polling failed to launch. Okay, let me try again. Um, so that's a different sort of a thing. So we want to kind of know what what's working for folks for zoom or in person. So we'll keep asking this question if that happened, although it, I'm not sure it went up. Does it look like there's a poll there? No. Okay, otherwise, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. And maybe we'll be in touch about other, um, other. it sounds like you've got some good background for things that uh, we're thinking about in the future for the land steward uh, program as well. So thanks, that was very helpful. <laughs> yeah. You can hang out if you want, um, or okay. I'm just gonna give folks thank a moment you. to do this um, poll and then. Sure. Well, thank you for having me and maybe again soon or yeah yeah or later yeah. or whatever or, thank or you later yeah mm -hmm. questions so folks on this one so far they're saying they like the zoom I'm not seeing the Zoom question. You don't see it. Some people have participated. So could it be in a different window? I don't know. Maybe. Well, oh, you know what? It's because you're a co-host. If yeah. you're a co-host, I know I can't, you can't. I can't respond to it because I'm a co-host. So. Yeah. Okay. Do you see it, Jamie? I bet you don't see it. Who's that? Who's that? Oh, okay. 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 I might be having some kind of connectivity issue here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible that it's me. It seems something seems stuck here. Okay, so maybe we should just um, end it and chat on the uh, chat on the phone in a second, Marcy. Shall we do that? Sure, that'll be fine. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm going to end the Zoom if I can here. Okay.